Welcome to the Dream Life is Real Life podcast with your host, Hannah Hermanson, bringing you real life stories of people who realized their dreams to educate and inspire you to create your legacy of abundance now. We're back and today we are hanging out with Aaron Wathen. Aaron is a holistic coach food-based counselor, or food abuse counselor, and the inspiring author of Why Can't I Stick to My Diet? How to End the Food Drama. Her philosophy, philosophy, simply put, health isn't a number on a scale or how often we exercise, but our lives as a whole. Several years ago, Erin was not at peace with her body, despite her wealth of knowledge on diet and exercise. She was always on a diet and yet never reached her goal weight. As a graduate of the Institute of Integrative Nutrition and a food addiction counselor, Erin was well-versed in the science behind health. As a certified spin instructor, vinyasa yoga teacher, me too, (laughs) and classical Pilates instructor, she understood the mechanics of health and fitness as well. Through a lot of trial and error, Erin found true nutrition to be the missing piece of the puzzle. It was then that Erin started her last diet, which ultimately became her food plan and the basis of her health coaching program, as well as her book, Why Can't I Stick to My Diet? The book is currently available online at Amazon and bookstores everywhere. Welcome, Erin. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I can relate so to so much of that story. Not just being a spin instructor, um, but yeah, kind of being on this hamster wheel of you know body image. I had an eating disorder, and so I'm excited today to dig into you know what what that um, lifestyle that you came to find with all this expertise. Absolutely, I think a lot of women hear my story or read my book or find out about me. They're like hey, you and I are the same person. I'm like, I know, right? Um, Because my story isn't that unique other than I'm willing to share it. Mm. And when I was willing to be like, yeah, this is the ugly part that I was doing and this is exactly, you know, the embarrassing things I used to do and the the shame I felt. Yeah, it wasn't illegal. Yeah, I wasn't quote unquote fat, but I still was uncomfortable all the time in my own skin. Yeah. And, and I would, you know, do things like be sick as a dog, would not go to the doctor in case they wanted to weigh me. Like mm-hmm. that's insanity. But at the time it made complete sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But I think for a lot of us that start this, str- that have this struggle, it starts when we're teenagers. Mm-hmm. It starts young. And I kept thinking it would go away, you know, when I got married, when I hit 30, when I had babies And it kept not going away. (laughs) Yeah. You don't age out of it. Mm -hmm. You don't fall in love and it goes away. You don't, you know, buy the house or have the the degree or whatever, unless you really figure out like, why am I eating when I'm not hungry? Why am I overeating? Like, why am I, why do I have secret stashes of food and, you know, my car or whatever? Mm -hmm. So until you're willing to go there, it's not just going to fade off. Right. Unfortunately. Right. Yeah. So let me just put this bluntly because I think you're already kind of getting to an answer here, but is there any point in trying to lose weight? There actually is a huge point in trying to lose weight, but there's only a point in it if you're willing to do the full work. And the best way I can explain it is sort of like how everyone's just con marrying their brains out now and taking everything out of their closet, you know, is it bringing Oh, you yes, yes. Because Marie Kondo, yes. Marie, Marie Kondo. So, so oftentimes when we diet, I'm using air quotes, if you could see it <laughs> now, audience, is we just want the quick fix. We just basically, you know, shove the extra sweater in the closet and shove the door and run off. And we don't think about why did we gain weight? What wasn't working that we gained weight? Sure, it's the holidays and that's just a nice smooth over thing (laughs) justification but christmas eve and christmas day isn't enough to gain 15 pounds like let's cut you know let's stop let's stop it with the bs to ourselves Mm -hmm. what wasn't working in our lives that we thought food would solve it that wasn't one extra cookie that was continually looking at food in the wrong way that was our emotions that was something bigger than one extra you know, piece of cake or whatever. So unless we're willing to change how 
we handle the world, how we look at food. And it could be something we don't want to deal with, such as maybe we really don't like our job or we really need to have that uncomfortable conversation with our boyfriend. It really varies because everybody has a different why that they're emotionally eating. And it, I mean, don't get me wrong. When I started, when I was a teenager, it was very different than when I stopped. But I just thought I had a problem with sugar. <laughs> that was what okay. I just thought it was. Like, sweet I tooth. Ate, <laughs> a sweet tooth. And isn't it cute that Aaron likes gummies? But she works out all the time, so it's no big deal, right? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until... I stopped all the craziness that I realized how the extra weight was serving me and what it was doing for me, which I know sounds crazy, but just no, this is huge. Yeah. I'm because so when I was about 20 pounds heavier than I am now, about 10 to 15 pounds heavier than when I wrote my book, I was a stay at home mom who taught spin and Pilates on the side. And I wasn't very happy doing the stay at home mom thing and the book fairs and the fluffing of the pillows and the, the mom talking drop off stuff. It was very, very um, unsatisfying for me, but I felt sort of ungrateful because I know so many people would love to stay home with their kids. But once my kids at a certain age and I'd volunteered and nothing really made me feel satisfied, I realized after I lost weight that I was using those extra pounds to almost protect myself. And then once I lost the 15 pounds, I felt confident enough to go out in the world again and, you know, write a book and put my pictures online and, you know, do crazy things that I'm doing now. But those 15 pounds are my excuse for why a lot of things weren't working. You know, my those 15 pounds were why I never went into New York City, which is where I live very close to, and auditioned for Soul Cycle, for example. Mm-hmm. They were why I didn't, you know, take a lot of things to the next level because I didn't feel really good about myself. So a lot of us have this extra weight that we just are spend so much time wrapped up in the drama of it all. Because you know, we gain it, we lose it, we gain it, we lose it. We, you know, we get really upset, we overeat, and then we starve ourselves, and then we're in this, in this big, great big, you know, roller coaster, hamster wheel, as you called it. And we're so used to that. Mm-hmm. We've been doing that off and on since we were teenagers. But what was the real problem? The real problem was I was, you know, bored. <laughs> I was really, really bored. And a lot of the eating I was doing was because I felt very ashamed of being bored. And I felt very ashamed of not being satisfied by being at home. So when I started my business and when things started really coming into place for me with coaching and you know writing and all these other things, then I realized that's what that weight was doing. That's how it was helping me in a way. So to circle back to what's the point in dieting, there's no point in dieting if you aren't going to take a cold, hard look at your life. If Mm -hmm. you just want to look cute for the wedding, sure, you can lose 10 pounds. It's going to come right back unless you stop going to food when you're frustrated with your boss. Because you're always going to have frustrations in the world and they're going to keep on making Ben and Jerry's. So the only thing in that, that little, you know, let's bring it back to algebra in eighth grade, you can con- con- change is how you respond. Mm-hmm. So you can acknowledge, yeah, my boss makes me crazy. They still make ice cream anyway, or my boss makes me crazy. Bring on the ice cream and we know where that gets us. But my boss makes me crazy. They still make ice cream and I'm not going to go there. I'm going to acknowledge my feeling. I'm going to journal. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to fill in the blank of 25 other coping mechanisms other than ice cream is where you're going to keep the weight off because you've changed your thought process. You've changed how you respond to stress. You've changed who you are now. So yeah, that will work. You will lose weight if you change how you think about things. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and I think that's just another layer to this whole, it's not just about calories in and calories out conversation. You know, we know that like the quality of food that you eat and the energy you have and the thoughts you think can all relate to, to your weight or like, you know, your, 
whatever your body image. Um, but also I think that's so important to really look at why, like, why do I have this shame? Why am I repeating these behaviors? Why do I have that stash? Why do I rely on exercise? Um, so what are some of the like tangible exercises or things to help people kind of get to that place and dig deeper that you recommend? It, you know, when I look back and think of like, what was I, what did I not see in myself? Like what was, what was, you know, the cry for help or whatever, you know, I had things like three pairs, sorry, three sizes of the same pair of pants. And I was like, oh, it's normal to fluctuate. Mm-hmm. That's not fluctuating. Interesting. <laughs> That's uh-huh. called yo-yoing. So if you, if your weight is up and down the scale, you know, more than two pounds in either direction, that's not your period, ladies. Sorry. Mm. You know, that kind of thing. If you always diet in January, if you always freak out before, before you have to wear a bathing suit, if you have secret eating habits that you would not want someone else to see, because that was a big one for me is my husband worked all the time when my kids were little. And as soon as they went to bed, I felt like I could just, you know, just exhale and breathe. And that was like when all the food came out. Mm-hmm. And if he came home early from a meeting, I, I mean, I'd hear the garage and like panic. Okay, that's yep. a sign. Problem. Then um, <laughs> So I think anything, anything you'd be embarrassed if someone w- walked in on you. And by the way, he didn't care if I was eating ice cream. Right. I cared if he saw me eating ice cream. So that's the problem. You know, anything where you would be really, really have really, really emotional if someone saw you doing something about food, that's a problem. Because I mean, mean, some people like get very, very panicky about, you know, if someone sees them eating bread or pizza or whatever it is, if you have an extreme emotion attached to food, let's explore that. Because ideally, what I get my clients to is, I've said, food neutral. Like, I don't live for food anymore. I don't get excited about food. I'm also not scared of it. And if someone says, where do you want to go to eat? Because I know you, you're you so picky, Aaron. I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not picky. I just, you know, at my house, I don't have, like, crazy stuff. But I've figured out a way to eat that's sustainable no matter where I go in the world. Like I went to Asia for a a month and didn't gain any weight because I figured out how I need to eat all the time no matter where I am. So being food neutral is very freeing because I remember being on diets where I had prepackaged food and I had little Tupperware dishes. That's not living. That's torture. Mm -hmm. So not getting emotional about food is so great just to have that like mental clarity and not remembering what I ate for lunch yesterday because it's not haunting me today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, that first just noticing what it, where does the shame come up? What are you hiding? What are the patterns? What's like the emotional charge? What is that around? And then being able to kind of explore that further, I think is a really great starting point. And something that's coming to mind for me as you're talking about, you know, being adaptable and being able to eat and not feel super emotional about it. Uh, One of the things, as I mentioned, I've had an eating disorder. And so, so much of this is resonating on my sort of recovery journey. Yet something that I still struggle with, and you're sort of speaking to, is moderation. Yeah. (laughs) Help me out. What do you have to say about finding moderation when it comes to not just being super restrictive and having the packaged food or, you know, binging all night, but like kind of giving yourself grace and having moderation. I feel like moderation is a unicorn. It, it over- <laughs> I, I, it's I, like I, balance, you know, like, oh, what the heck is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Balance is even worse when you have kids and everyone's like, it's just finding the balance. I'm like, okay, Ivanka Trump, thank you. Mm-hmm. No, um, I mean, for me, I had an eating disorder when I was in high school and off and on when I'm really upset or stressed out, it does rear its ugly head. Cause I think once you have that, that monster in you, it, yeah. it can come out. I mean, I think you and I are talking the same language here. Yeah. For me, moderation is very personally defined because I mean, I've been to these, you know, inpatient places or talk to people that run them who think that my approach is insane. They're like, well, why can't you eat sugar? I'm like, cause it makes me crazy. 
Mm. Like, what's wrong with a little bit of sugar? I'm like, well, first of all, it's completely Poison. genetic modified, <laughs> and it makes you go nuts and it, you know, on and on and on and on and on. And they just completely disagree with me. And I'm like, I can show you studies of rats' brains and I can do this, that, and the other. I just know for myself, if I have sugar, meaning, you know, a bag of candy, for example, not, not talking about fruit, I don't like how I feel afterwards. Mm-hmm. So for me, I just know how I want to feel tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So, and I feel like I've kind of had my lifetime supply of sugar already, Mm -hmm. but I'm fine. You know, if it's my kid's birthday, yeah, I'll have like a bite of their cake, but I'm not going to raid their candy on Halloween. Like I used to, Mm -hmm. because I don't do moderation well with that. And when I used to work for, um, Weight Watchers a million years ago, they're really, really big on moderation. And I know they still are. They really sell moderation hard. And the thing about it is I feel like moderation is a really good way to never keep weight off because you're never getting rid of those triggering foods. You're always keeping them in your life and you're never giving your body a chance to not have, you know, a lot of sugar, a lot of carbs. And the thing about it is people sometimes like, you're going to take away my sugar. I'm like, you know what? If you decide in 12 weeks when we're done that you don't like my approach, they're still going to sell you sugar. Mm -hmm. I guarantee it. It's still going to be in stores. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You're not going to decide you don't get it anymore. But I think with moderation, it's like the holy grail. Like everyone thinks I want to be normal. I want to be a normal eater. And my answer to that is always, are you a normal person? Are you an average person? Because average means you, you know, you live in an average house or have an average car and you're average happy. You know, so it's like most of us don't want an average life. So is average meaning you have a, a big piece of cake, a little piece of cake and who decides who average is when it comes to food anyway? I mean, we could talk serving sizes all day long, mm-hmm. but with moderation, especially for those of us who have had a very hard time with eating disorders or body dysmorphia or any of that. It's very hard to find moderation because it's either all of it or none of it. And for me, I just, you know, there's so many foods that I know I don't like how I feel afterwards. And that's what I really hold on to. Not that I can't have it, I don't do that sort of mind game stuff to me myself anymore because I know that's just a really bad way to be Hmm. is I don't like how I feel afterwards. You know, I don't like how I feel afterwards when I steal all my kids candy. (laughs) I don't like how I feel afterwards when I eat a tub of frosting. I don't like how I feel afterwards physically, emotionally, and mentally when I eat, you know, two pounds of gummy bears. So that is why I don't eat them in moderation. Interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. And I think you have to have the strength in your brain power to recognize that that is a conscious decision, a choice you're making, as opposed to a restriction or a deprivation. So yeah. I appreciate that food for thought. Uh-huh. Um, and now, Erin, I want to take a look at a different angle a little bit, kind of step away from the nitty gritty and nutrition and hear a little bit more about how you went from that stay-at-home mom who was just teaching a few fitness classes into a business owner and a health coach. So what was that transition like for you? Was it just one day you decided I'm going to open up for business or how did it come to be? It, um, it came to be that, you know, I, I really got serious about wanting to figure out like what was wrong with me because I just was sick of having like little secrets from my husband and little stashes of candy everywhere. And, and I would just look forward to my four o'clock diet Coke so much. And I just felt like I was just ping ponging all day between sugar and NutraSweet, sugar and you know, artificial sweetener. And I didn't make a big deal about it. I didn't proclaim it on Facebook that I was getting, I just did it for my, I, I was able to do it. And that was only because I had gotten into really nutrition because I kept always trying to find the magic exercise that was going to make me skinny. 
And that's why I have so many stinking certifications. Mm. <laughs> because I kept thinking, oh, if I, if I learn how to teach this, then maybe that will do it. Well, no, mm-hmm. I, I just know how to teach it and now I can teach it. Um, yeah. And I do enjoy teaching. It's just a lot of the reason I became really involved in certain exercises was because of self-interest. But when I became a health coach and I realized how so much of being healthy wasn't just the number on the scale, because that's what the number on the scale was so much of what I was always obsessed with. And if I had the magic number, then life would be perfect. Well, that's what I thought, right? And I thought once I got to the magic number, I could eat however I wanted, which again makes zero sense, but a lot of us sort of think that. And when I learned about other types of ways people eat, you know, veganism or macrobiotics and all these different food theories, and I really was able to figure out how to eat that wasn't dieting, just how to live. Because I'd never really been living. I'd always been dieting or or eating in a way that was going to require me to go on a diet. Mm. And that was like the first big education step. And I was teaching spinning and they tell you to, you know, go get some clients. I'm like, how am I going to get clients? Like go to the client store? Like I don't know where to find (laughs) clients. So it was New Year's and I had a a very good following where I was teaching and mm. they, they emailed me all the time. Hey, can you play, you know, this song? It's my birthday on Tuesday or whatever. And I said, hey, you guys, um, I'm starting this business. I just need testimonials. So if you will commit, you know, six sessions, you got to meet with me half an hour once a week. Um, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll come to, you know, I was teaching at a corporate gym. So I'll come, if, if you, I'll schedule it around my spin classes. All you have to do is just commit to six. I just need a testimonial. So that was really the first big step in that direction. And in the middle of this, I became really interested in food addiction because I've been hearing, you know, some noise about sugar addict, sugar is addictive, sugar addiction. I just sort of ignored it. I thought it was just some hype or whatever. And then I learned more about it when I was in school and I just like Googled, Googled it. And this woman in Iceland's name came up. I must have been feeling very uh, brave that day because I just emailed her. <laughs> I was like, hey, can I talk to you sometime? She said, sure, let's jump on a Zoom call. I said, what's a Zoom call? <laughs> it's two and a half years ago. I had no idea. What <laughs> I didn't. I mean, why would I? Mm-hmm. I, mean, I had no reason to know what one was. I was you know, sure. doing bake sales and that kind of thing. <laughs> and she sent me a link and then I realized it was like Skype, only not for old people. <laughs> and so... She was just telling me about food addiction and how she's dealing with like all these doctors and helping people that, you know, would normally get gastric bypass, but they have a 12 step approach and on and on and on. And she had just started um, a, count, a certification program and it was three weeks into like a 17 week program. And she said, You went to grad school, right? And I said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, Well, if you can catch up, you can be in my program. And I said, okay. But I had to do a month's worth of work in a, a week, get my transcripts. There was a recommendation. I mean, it was insanity. Mm. But I thought like that was such a sign from the universe. You know, I just call this random woman. She makes time for me. She invites me because she thinks I seem like I'd be a good asset. And then I get in this class and it's full of like doctors. <laughs> Mm. And registered dietitians and level really up, girlfriend. <laughs> totally, but I mean, it was talking like trial by fire. Yeah, and people that were you know psychiatrists and like I had I didn't even know enough to know what I didn't know those first couple of weeks. People that work for you know the, um, the health department in Canada and just the real deal. And there I was, and they called me the Pilates teacher for the first month. I'm like, I have a name. Mm-hmm. Um, and they eventually realized to take me seriously. But um, that, was, that was really fascinating too because I didn't realize that food addiction is accepted all over the world. In America, people think it's crazy town. Mm. But in Canada, you can go to a, a one-month food rehab basically and the government will pay for it. That's how accepted it is in Canada. Yeah, that place. In parts, in parts of the mid- Middle East, it's – completely understood to be real. Um, in America, I'm sure we could talk about the food lobbyists or whatever. It is not seen in the same way. 
Mm -hmm. So that was the next step. And then I really wanted a way to share what I had learned. And I remember when 50 shades of gray was really popular. Oh yes. And and, Oh yeah. Right. And (laughs) women would read things on their e-reader. They wouldn't necessarily read in a paperback. Yeah. So my thought was if I could get this information, I mean, yeah, people still buy books, but if I could get it on a Kindle, on an iPad, on your phone, women would read it because it's really a book for women. I mean, men buy it, but mostly women. Yeah, but that's a genius way to help us break the stigma and get the information out out. there. So that's why I wanted to write a book because, yeah, I I could blog about it. Yeah, I could have one-on-one clients, which is, I mean, very effective. But as far as getting it out there, that like, look, ladies, it's not your fault. The food is junky. But also, Mm -hmm. why are you eating when you're not hungry? Because you need both. You need to get rid of the food and you need to do the internal work. Yeah. So that's how I ended up writing my book. Wow. Yeah. That makes so much sense. And I love the the courage to, and the stick with itness that you had because I do the same thing where I'll get into a room or a course with people who I'm like, oh my God, I do not belong here. They're all smarter and better and faster and all these things than me. And if you have the stick with itness, you quickly find like, but I've been like living with this for my whole life. So I am an expert. And you, <laughs> you know, that, that really beats down that imposter syndrome so often is to just stick with it and own your story. Like you said at the beginning, so we are going to transition into a little bit of a pop quiz. Uh-oh. Are you ready? I if you did one that. month and one me- week, you can do this. <laughs> okay. All right. I did not know there was going to be a final. All right. Just three last questions. Okay, cool. And the first one is, what is one thing listeners can do today to get closer to their dream life? Drink more water. Mm, good one. I like it. Question number two is if you could give all the listeners a gift, maybe it was some sort of tangible resource that helped you or changed your life, what would you hand all of the listeners? Are you still thinking? I'm thinking. Sorry. That doesn't <laughs> okay. I would, I would definitely say – a journal so they could just keep track of their thoughts. Mm. I think, you know, I guess, so I guess a pen and a journal. So I have two gifts because that, you know, being really, really honest with yourself, writing it down and it's not, your phone is not the same thing. Your computer is not the same thing. There's something tactile about writing it and then look back on it. And and the ability to reflect is priceless. Mm, Beautiful. I really strongly encourage everyone to start doing that. Yes. Very good. The last question, Erin, is where can people stay connected with you and learn more about what you do and get your book? (laughs) Uh, My book is on Amazon. It's also in bookstores and barnesandnoble.com. And my website and my social handles are all the same thing. And it's Erin Wathen Wellness, one word. W-A-T-H-E-N, right? Yes, W-A-T-H-E-N. Awesome. Well, Erin, I so appreciate your vulnerability, your honesty, and sharing your time and expertise with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was fun. Yeah. Well, folks, I will be back next week. You know it with another inspiring guest to help you make your dream life your real life. You've been learning how to make your dream life your real life with Hannah Hermanson. To get the resources mentioned on today's show and to listen to past episodes, visit www.dreamlifeisreallife.com. 